Hello, good afternoon. This session is uh, focused on using the data that you get from many different sources to drive energy efficiency. One of the things we see is uh, how do you make decisions in terms of where to invest your money? It is always resources are going to be very, very limited. And we have a very good panel here of speakers. Uh, we have uh, George Dennis from uh, Cushman Wakefield. He's a managing director there, and he's uh, supporting Adobe Campus and Adobe facilities worldwide. We have uh, Victor. Victor is from uh, director of uh, global operations and facilities in uh, Brocade. And uh, he's been looking into not only facilities, but data centers, mm -hmm. and have used extensively the data to drive efficiency in his buildings. Ralph Rene is from NetApp. He's a uh, director of site operations. And he's been in the business for a very, very long time and has some very good case studies and very good data. He'll show you how they have used the information to drive changes in their operations and also to do energy enhancements on the buildings to drive efficiencies. My name is Mukesh Kutter. I'm the energy director at Oracle. And we also have a portfolio of very large number of buildings globally, almost to, uh, 20 million square foot. And we use this information to identify which are our hawks, which are our good ones, and try to see what we can do. So what we want to address today is, uh, I hope this works. All right. It does. I did not. OK. So the question here is, when you are looking for data, so what are the type of data that are easily available? You probably have a data that you get from your electricity bill. You get once a month. Some places I know in Europe, they send you data, you know, bill once in six months to small accounts. But you also have data nowadays available to you for every 15 minutes, every day of the month, every year. So that's amount of almost 36,000 data points. And that's a very invaluable data. This used to be that only large buildings could get that data, but now every residential customer also has that piece of information. So you use the information to gleam through and say, so we have the data, but what do you make sense of it? Is this the information you're looking for or the data? So we look into how we interpret and analyze the data. So there are going to be some discussions here after the presentations. I have a couple of slides that we are going to talk about and see how we identified what could be going wrong or what could be fi uh, figured out. Are there any references and benchmark? If you are the only people doing the work, are you in the middle? Are you in the high end, low end? How do you find that out? There are a couple of sources available for you. Uh, EPA Energy Star is one of the big ones, which we can see where you stand in terms of the benchmark with the rest of the industry. Um, this is a good one. Interval meter data that has been there for some time and smart meter data. How do you interpret that and take some simple actions? And we have a couple of case studies that we can show you that you can do that. And then again, once you take an action, you want to see that really did the save energy or not. So with that, I'm going to introduce, you know, pass on the baton to, to George, who is going to talk about his experiences and his work he's done at Adobe. Great, thank you. Um, he's gonna take a second to change the uh, slide deck. Uh, so I'm George Denise. I'm the Global Account Manager for Cushman and Wakefield uh, at Adobe. I've actually been at Adobe for about 12 years. Uh, I oversee their global portfolio, about uh, 49 sites around the world, 3.2 million square feet. Nine of it is actually buildings, the rest of it, uh, uh, the other 40 um, sites are lease space and somebody else's typically multi-tenant building. Um, so this is... Um, a little quick blurb about Adobe, but I think everybody knows who Adobe is, so uh, we'll go to the next slide. A little quick blurb about Cushman Wakefield. Those are, these are my sponsors, Adobe and Cushman Wakefield, so I have to put their, their slide up there, but uh, everybody knows pretty much who Cushman Wakefield is anyway. If nothing else, you know they have those real estate signs on all those buildings. This is the uh, Adobe headquarters building from a slightly different perspective. Um, Again, uh, nine, uh, nine buildings, 40, uh, about 49 sites uh, around the world, uh, 3.2 million square feet. Uh, two million of that is the nine buildings, and the other million is the 41 sites. 
So we're mostly going to talk about what we're doing with the buildings. We do a lot with the lease space too, but we don't have necessarily, we submeter it whenever we can. Uh, we do work with it, but we don't have as much control, obviously, in somebody else's building as we do uh, with the own buildings. Uh, key, key factors, I guess, uh, we have uh, 23 LEED certifications, 17 at the platinum level. All of the owned buildings and the one building that they lease entirely and manage uh, are all uh, 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 certified through lease EB or EBOM uh, at the platinum level. Uh, over the last 10 to 12 years for the entire portfolio, we've undertaken about 157 uh, different projects. Most of those energy, but energy and sustainability projects. Uh, spent a little under $5 million, have received back uh, about a million dollars in uh, incentives or rebates, and have reduced total operating costs by about, uh, annual operating costs by about $3.2 million, which is about a uh, 1.2 uh, year simple payback and about a 84% uh, return on investment. Uh, probably key here for this group is that we've reduced our electricity use by about 50%. Um, also, uh, we have more recently installed um, fuel cells. We have on the San Jose campus about a dozen Bloom Energy fuel cells, uh, first generation. They supply about 32% of our total uh, electricity use uh, uh, there. In San Francisco, we have two of the second generation. San Jose, San Jose is about a million square feet. 12 first generation supplying about a, a third of the energy. Uh, San Francisco is about a third the size, uh, about 325,000 square feet. Uh, two of the second generation uh, bloom fuel cells supply about 50% of our electricity use there. Similar uses, both uh, the San Jose has four uh, data centers and 68. Um, uh, uh, I'll think of it in a second, labs. Uh, uh, development labs, testing labs. Uh, San Francisco has one data center and a, a smaller number, I think, uh, eight to ten uh, testing labs. So really similar uses. This is just kind of a, a quick summary of what we're doing with the buildings. Uh, uh, lead Platinum, good Energy Star scores, good solid waste diversion numbers. Uh, San Jose site, uh, Similar numbers again to what you just saw. Um, these are the kinds of things we're discovering by studying the data and some of the projects we've put in place. Uh, our very first, uh, well, basic monitoring, I think, on a building we've been doing ever since we've had buildings, and that is to do our daily rounds and read the meters manually. and. You know, that's, that's what we did in the Stone Ages. Uh, we chipped that numbers into a, a stone tablet and uh, preserved it and studied it. Uh, more recently, and probably a very good tool, basic tool is Energy Star, Makesh mentioned. Uh, Energy Star is probably the most comprehensive out there, easiest one to work with. Uh, looks at a number of factors, including the climate zone you're in, uh, the size of your building, the number of people in it, the number of PCs in it, uh, other uh, uses, such as size of your cafeteria, your data centers, et cetera, et cetera, and then tries to compare you in terms of your energy efficiency with all other buildings in the country. Uh, probably the best part besides all of that is that it's free to use. Uh, so it's a useful tool. It's a simple tool. It's a basic tool. Um, beyond that, I think, uh, you know, we looked at going back to 2002, 2003, uh, PG&E had digital, uh, almost real-time meters, but day-late reporting. Uh, that wasn't good enough when we were doing a lot of uh, programs, so the first thing we did is sub-metered it and put in an ION software system so we could track it. That whole piece for the three buildings in San Jose cost us $39,000 and was very useful uh, immediately as we suddenly had a graph of what our usage looked like. We could see startup spikes and pillows and other spikes for other reasons. and these are some of the kinds of, of uh, things we discovered with it. Uh, if I'm looking at the right slide. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, for example, is we immediately saw a spike in the, in the graph. Um, the uh, turned out to be an issue in the programming for the chiller plant. 
that we, our engineers had always suspected was an issue. We had had engineering firms out to look at it a couple of times. They said, no, everything's pretty much the way it's supposed to be. But as soon as we had a graph of it, a picture of it, we could immediately see that there really was a problem. We brought them back out. It was a very quick fix and it saved $36,000 a year. That problem had been in place for, that was 2003, I believe. So that was the first building that was built in 1996. So that's 36,000 a year times that number of years. A um, lot of other things like that. So tremendous value just in being able to visualize, see a picture of what's going on. Um, fast forward a few years and we got more and more into it and we've now spent almost a million dollars on our monitoring system. However, we've also found with all of the things we've discovered and repaired with this monitoring system, um, we call it IBIS, which stands for Integrated Building Interface System or Intelligent Building Interface System. Uh, we developed it with a company in uh, San Ramon called Integrated Building Solutions. And it just gives us a lot of powerful energy to work, uh, information to work with. Um, and the payback, as I say, with all of the things we've discovered and been able to address, uh, the payback ends up being about three and a half years, which is a little long for some building owners, but for those of us who are in it for the long haul, I think most of us agree on most investments, a three and a half year return uh, isn't bad. So, if you look at this graph up here, these are a number of screenshots of different aspects of the, of the graph or of the uh, system. This one is showing the energy usage in real time for the three buildings, and then this is the consolidation. The, what happens is each night at midnight, our system, we've automated it uh, essentially, so we're automated uh, commissioning in a sense. Um, at midnight, it looks at the weather, local weather station, looks to see what the, the uh, weather's gonna be the next day. Uh, it then goes back over the past 12 months and looks by the five most similar days and it creates that little green band. Those represent the, the uh, actual energy use within those five days. It then tracks forward, if you see the darker, that's, where, that's the time right there that the shot was taken and it tracks it. If this is running within that green band or below the green band, then it's doing what it's supposed to do. If it goes above the green band, I think right in here you see a red spike. Right over here you see a red spike. Uh, it turns red when it goes above that band, uh, depending on the size and length of that spike um, or whatever that overage is, that variance is. It goes into alarm and depending on the parameters, it automatically writes a work order through our computerized maintenance management system to the engineers. One of the things we used to say is you can't manage what you don't measure. So then we developed all of these systems to give us the data we needed. Then we said, we've got all this data, you have to do something with it because we discovered building operating engineers aren't really analytical for the most part. Some are, but generally speaking, they focus on work orders. So we decided, okay, let's have the system write them work orders. And now they're, they're tracked and followed and, and they have to close those work orders out and have a satisfactory uh, solution with what happened. Property in Seattle, this is uh, about 160,000 square feet and is uh, wholly leased by Adobe. Same kind of numbers, uh, electricity reduced 19%, um, uh, much smaller numbers because of the, uh, of the size. And, and while 19% of electricity may not sound that <coughs> much better, when you consider that the cost of electricity in Seattle is less than half of what it is here, then that starts to uh, make more sense. Uh, same kinds of things again, uh, some of the projects we did and their returns. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you read quickly, you can see there's a bunch there. This is my favorite graph in the whole wide world. While we were doing all this work in San Jose, we added a third tower, we added two more data centers, we added 40 more labs, um, and we increased the population by 45%. So to look at an absolute energy use graph isn't that impressive, doesn't tell that good a story. When you look at it on a per square foot or a headcount basis, it does. But the Seattle site over the past five years has had about the same population. We've probably built up the server room a little bit. We've added 40 people there, but generally it's been pretty stable. And so you can see the, the on the graph, the uh, first columns, The this is uh, 12 months of the year, looking at a five-year period of time. 
The first column, the highest of light blue, is the first year, and each year successively it's come down. This is probably for somebody working with energy. Uh, for me, at least, it's my favorite picture next to uh, pictures of my kids, I think. Um, you know, or, or two puppies I uh, recently acquired. Um, latest is going in and tearing out of the walls in our space, opening it up, putting in uh, motion, act creating neighborhoods, putting in motion activated HVAC and motion activated overhead lighting, um, plug load uh, uh, based on sense motion sensors, and in a building that had already had an Energy Star score of 100, um, we um, were able to go from 80 people per floor to 135 people per floor and still reduce electricity use by 65%. So uh, really good impact. Quick pictures. This is looking at it from a three-dimensional model. Some of the, uh, uh, the uh, information pages we have. Um, I'm going trying to go fast here because we've got other folks coming up. And that's, that's a quick overview of it. I wanted the others to have a chance, and then uh, if you have questions later. Okay. Thank you, George. Yep. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Next, we have a presentation from Brocade. Victor? Thank you, Mukesh. It's coming on. Okay. So jumping right into it, I'll talk, um, you know, give you guys a brief overview about Brocade. I think unlike Adobe, most people don't know what Brocade does. Uh, talk about three specific examples where we looked at interval data. So I want to share our findings and our results. And then also besides energy efficiency, you know, one of the things that we always contemplate as building operators is, is that fine line between energy efficiency and reliability because sometimes you can cross that line. So a little bit about Brocade, it started with four employees in 1995, we're now 4,500 employees strong, uh, operating in over 160 countries worldwide. We actually have a combination of virtual offices, leased offices, multi-tenant offices, and own space, uh, similar to, to Adobe's portfolio. And really what we do is storage area networks, we, 70% um, of the revenue in the market, we own that piece. And the way I like to describe Brocade is, you know, we own 70% of that. Uh, sand business where uh, Cisco owns 70% of the IP business so we want to take over their space they want to take over our space just to give you a, a sense of again who our competition is so jumping into the first example um, you know again this is regarding interval data and this is actually the actual readings of a lab it's only about 80 racks it's our sales and marketing lab in San Jose here you can see that they're operating anywhere from 250 kW um, to 290 kW, and if I were to put it in terms of dollars, on a yearly uh, basis, they actually uh, spend around $300,000. So when you look at this graph, you can see that, um, you know, by month we have it where we're trending sort of the actual consumption, and then it's hard to see, but uh, I'll try to point that out. You can see these flat lines here. That's if you average the monthly data. So when we did that, what we realized is that it's basically, it almost looks like a step function. So then we started asking, well, well what's happening here? Well, who best to ask but the lab managers themselves. So what we learned is that they were actually turning off equipment when it was not in use. What a novel idea, right? I mean, something we all do at home, hopefully. So then what we thought of was, well, let's take what they're doing and uh, implement it across the company. Right where we have over 3,000 racks, where my energy bill is close to $10 million. So just from this example, and by literally working with the lab users to change behavior, we've been working with them to leverage scheduling software that turns off equipment automatically when it's not in use. And you can see here in the second quarter of, of, a two, of May, April, you can see that they were growing pretty consistently but when we implemented the challenge when they were turning off equipment, when it was not in use, you can see that effectively we cut their power consumption, you can argue, by half or by 75%. Again, with no basically investment at all, just really by changing their behavior. So that was one thing we learned. Um, another thing that you know, we, we want to talk about is, again, metrics. 
So in data center uh, buildings or operations, a common metric used is the power utilization uh, effective metric. It's really a ratio of the total building power used divided by your IT power. So besides the IT power, the second consumer of electricity is your chillers in your buildings. So here what we have is a scatter plot. You can see all the blue dots are actually millions of points uh, prior to um, July of 2012. And then we put a polynomial on that scatter plot. And what we realize is here we're plotting basically our PUE. And you can see that um, we operate between 1.1 and 1.3, which is really best in class. And you could argue that basically 60% of the time we're operating you know, below 1.2. So what we decided to do in this experience, we said, well, again, without investing a whole lot of money, what happens if we change the set point temperature for the chill water system? What we started seeing is this red trend line that we were actually, by just simply raising the chill water set point and by leveraging our water side economizer, we were uh, you know, getting a better PUE effectively throughout the year. By benchmarking it and using it pre previous historical data, we could actually also see that at 69 degrees wet bulb, you know, that, that equation changed. So by again looking at this, um, I call it interval data, and somebody might argue and say, well, wow, this is over a year and a half of data. Um, we were actually realized some savings again just by um, studying the data, making changes, and also realizing that at some point there is a tipping point. So making changes there as well. So this is another uh, good example. Again, uh, a lot going on here, but basically what I want to call your attention to is, is these spikes sort of in the middle of the graph. And what effectively is happening there is a chiller was turning on and off every 15, 30 minutes. Um, and again, going back to uh, the principle that chillers consume the most amount of energy besides your IT load, we found that this chiller had been cycling on and off for about three to six months. So imagine, like any pump or motor, when you start that piece of equipment up, it ramps up so high, it's, it's really the exponential curve on a power curve. So again, by just identifying this, by looking at really, uh, if you look at the um, x-axis here, you can see that we had to drill down to basically the hour or the minute, if you will, to find this anomaly where we had to basically, again, only change the sequence of operations to fix this issue to save a lot of money. So that was another example that we found, again, looking at interval data. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. You can see how this data has been used very effectively by, uh, by Victor in trying to find opportunities for saving. Um, Ralph is going to talk about his experiences with uh, NetApp, and he has uh, equally good uh, experiences in this area. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mukesh. And uh, when Mukesh earlier introduced me, he said I've been around a, a very, very long time. <laughs> so that, that must mean I'm old. But I met uh, an old friend of mine in the back here, Kim Ryle, who was my PG&E rep like 20-something years ago. So I guess it's pretty accurate. OK, a little bit about NetApp. Uh, most people don't know who we are. We're not necessarily a household name. But essentially, we're the enterprise storage provider to many of the things you use in your daily lives, like your Facebook page is stored on NetApp storage. Your Yahoo email is actually uh, stored on NetApp storage. So we're behind the scenes, but we're everywhere. Uh, well recognized for our Great Place to Work initiative. This one is uh, we were ranked number three in the world's best multinational workplace back in 2012. Uh, similar to Brocade, we got a presence in 46 countries with about 150 offices and over 12,000 employees worldwide. We're a $6.3 billion enterprise as of our last fiscal year. Uh, at the Sunnyvale headquarters, we, we do have a total of about 1.7 million square feet. 1.3 million of that is actually Energy Star buildings. Uh, most of our portfolio that's uh, later than 2,000 are all Energy Star buildings. In addition to that, we uh, began our LEED initiative uh, a couple of years ago, but we've got about 600,000 square feet of LEED buildings. Two of them are actually certified. The one building that doesn't have the Energy Star label sort of on the 
far right of this map is a brand new building that we haven't yet occupied. Uh, but we are uh, with a application with USGBC for lead gold under new construction. On the site, we've got three uh, fairly large data centers totaling about, uh, well, of that 10.5 megawatts of peak demand, uh, seven megawatts of it was represented in data center operations. It's just kind of a, a simple diagram of what goes into our energy management programs, but in terms of instrumentation or data acquisition, we, we do it through a variety of platforms, but predominantly our EMS platform, which is simply an energy management system. We do a parallel metering, uh, a socket parallel metering, and we do a shadow billing off the utility at our main switchboards, and then we do some sub-metering downstream of the main. Um, we actually use a Square D ion currently, but it was a power measurements limited prior to the Square D acquisition of that technology. Our building automation system is uh, automated logic controls, and we use their energy reports function, which is quite comprehensive. And actually, when you integrate uh, EMS with BAS, you could really uh, get a single dashboard, similar to what uh, George was doing with his IBIS. Uh, in addition to that, we did implement uh, Accenture as a uh, Accenture Smart Building Solutions platform, which is really a, a combination of automated fault detection and diagnostics along with uh, regression analysis. And then in addition to that, we also use a, uh, which is really in the DCIM space, but it's um, it's a product called Modius that we use uh, actually more for energy management than data center infrastructure management. So those are the inputs into the energy management programs. Uh, some of the outcomes or measures we implement are continuous commissioning. We can do that through predominantly our building automation system, along with the interval meter data that we do in our parallel metering. In addition, we've uh, implemented retro commissioning in uh, about seven of the nine uh, Energy Star buildings. Uh, just every year, we'll budget for energy efficiency measures. In addition, we'll uh, implement some capital projects to improve energy efficiency. One of the things I think um, the idea of this session was really to look at interval data. So what we're getting out of our ION system is really a daily report on energy <coughs> consumption. So you can see the two sort of large spikes on this. Those are the buildings that house uh, relatively large data centers. But this is really just doing a, a day over day uh, comparing to the uh, same day last week. Uh, the value of this is really if those peaks spike uh, tremendously, it at least will alert you to go look into and investigate. So everyone on my staff, including all of our technicians, gets these reports. They find it a little bit obnoxious because you get this every day. But once you get through kind of scanning it, you're, you know, we get it in uh, numerical and in your mind, you read it sort of graphically. Oh, I screwed that up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Mukesh, you'll have to get me restarted. I'm going to. But, but the point of it is really looking at your energy consumption on a daily basis allows you to actively manage it. Hmm. Thank you, Mukesh. What's happening it here? Yeah, All right. Good. Okay, so uh, just a couple case studies I thought would be maybe interesting. One of our buildings, uh, pretty well performing. Uh, there's a, a variety of benchmarks. Certainly, Energy Star is one of them. Uh, there's a database out there called CBEX, and, and you could kind of characterize your energy performance against CBEX. This building does quite well on an annualized basis, about 13 kilowatt hours per square foot per year. Uh, it's a lead gold under EBOM, Energy Star, as I mentioned, but we do do chill water plants. So the picture on your right can kind of show you that we've got a chill water plant on there. And just some simple energy efficiency measures like daylighting and uh, CO2 monitoring, which is in many cases uh, counterproductive to energy efficiency since you tend to flood your building with fresh air when you don't need to. But one of the things you can get is some real good data out of a well-instrumented building automation system. This was just looking at uh, spikes in our supply air temperatures in a couple of air handlers that serve this building. But it, it leads you to uh, implement uh, some efficiencies or optimization as a result of 
really what is uh, programming errors. And one of the difficulties uh, when you're a uh, controls technician is you, you program things, but you don't necessarily have the ability to really track performance and, and do some direct correlations. Uh, so you do have to study your data. But what we were able to do is smooth out some of the spiking and, and, and try to match the air handler operations so that one isn't essentially uh, overproducing over another. The, the air handlers serve the exact same square footage. Another thing we also found out, and the picture on your left is really, you'll see a supply air temperature uh, rising while the air handler is not operating. Uh, what this led to us is a discovery that we were actually turning on our reheat coils, at least flowing our boiler uh, loop pumps, uh, flowing hot water without moving air. Terribly energy inefficient since you're not utilizing that hot water. But it was really just a, a simple thing that we were starting uh, our pumps and turning on the boiler based on temperature calls, but we had the air handler locked out on an occupancy schedule. So what this was really resulting is very excessive uh, supply air temperature set point that's just migrating up through the VAVs all the way up to the center in the air handler on a five-story building. Uh, but that was easily uh, identified, and, and we actually seen this first in the interval data at the building level where we actually seen the boiler and the boiler pumps come on at a particular time when no other energy is really being consumed. Uh, so we, on the bottom left, is just implemented and matched the, uh, the reheat call with, uh, with the air handler. So some of these uh, things that we identified were just a few items that uh, we were able to do to uh, incrementally improve energy efficient. We were actually in a very efficient building, so these are just incremental steps that we did to become a little more efficient. Um, but low-hanging fruit in the sense that the data drove you to these optimizations, and it didn't require any capital investment. Uh, another building, uh, this one has a large lab in it, so it's got a fairly large energy bill and a, a little bit more of a, a demand, two megawatt lab in there. Uh, one of the things we do have, though, is a, an incredible amount of instrumentation, and, and all of this data needs to be processed to, in order to optimize. But just kind of, even in a relatively small building, uh, 122,000 square feet, we've got, you know, 33,000. BMS points. Uh, it's a lot of data to process. Some of it you don't necessarily review, but it's, you know, as an example, uh, rooftop units will have 12 points on it. Uh, each one of the cry units will have 10 points on it. The VFDs, uh, there's a lot of information you can pull down off of VFD. Uh, but even your VAVs, uh, in our case, zone dampers, there's some points we pull off of it. So. There's a lot of information that you could obtain and, and analyze off your building uh, automation system. Some of the uh, things that we had discovered was an ability to optimize further. And uh, without going through the entire list, it was just really looking at uh, various set points in terms of supply air, uh, comparing that uh, with the return air, and, and trying to fine tune the building, if you will. We kind of came up with these, all five of these measures really didn't result into any significant energy savings, but it also did validate that the building was operating relatively efficient, and again, uh, incremental efficiency. This information, however, was gathered from uh, the Accenture Smart Building System, which was a capital investment in the form of software, which um, really then came into a question as to the cost of implementation versus the return on investment. Um, you know, without disclosing the cost, you could say that uh, this had a two-year ROI and these are annualized savings, so that'll give you an idea how much we spent to implement the program. What it also does is kind of prove as a testing ground, do you kind of implement this and scale it out across your entire campus? That becomes a little bit cost prohibitive. Uh, you know, George mentioned uh, approaching a million dollars for his IBIS implementation. It is something we're seriously investigating, but we're also very pragmatic in making sure that we've got a business case to justify that investment. 
some things I just wanted to add. This event actually took place Wednesday night, and because I still have an operations role, or not willing to give it up, uh, these were alarms that came through about 1.30 in the morning. And, uh, and basically, this is the interval data, and as you can see, um, there's a big dip there. Which one's the laser? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you can see that energy dropped down significantly, like 170 kW, but then peaked right back up to uh, 720. Just looking at interval data, you would then want to investigate that. So if you just had a, a PG&E meter, you would still capture this. This is the PG&E meter. We, we parallel, so it's PG&E's, PT's, and CT's that we're reading. But this warrants investigation. Well, what happened here? Why is this happening? Um, so we investigate. Okay. Killed it. Uh, yeah, killed it by the remote. <laughs> if you don't mind flipping. Yeah, yeah, it's not even going forward with this one, so I had to oh. go back and. Who's Whose PC is that? <laughs> it's not even his it's not the operator, I can assure you. The clicker okay. operator. You can go down one slide here. Right. Thank you. All right, so I apologize. These are actually screenshots out of our uh, ALC, and you can barely see the resolution on that. But basically, the what we're, we're seeing here... Yeah. Uh, okay, so what you're seeing here is an economizer, outside air damper opening up, the chill water plant shutting down. So this has got an inverse relationship. This was at a specific moment in time that caused that dip was the chill water plant shut off and we went into outside air economizer. But uh, what it also demonstrated is that the fan energy exceeded the energy of the chill water plant. And that's why the spike back up was greater than uh, the demand when we were running in mechanical mode. So it leads you to go investigate and figure out how to optimize this. And again, this was derived off of interval data. Another just, so you, you gotta go one step further and go, okay, what are the environmental conditions that cause you to, one, go out of economizer mode go into, and the timestamp is somewhere, I guess right about here. So we certainly uh, had a temperature decrease, which really opened up the economizer damper. Uh, but in addition, very interesting microclimate going on here where we've got a, essentially a humidity spike in the really early morning hours. Uh, so then it hit this threshold, which then brought the chill water plant back on because we have to go in and dehumidify. But in any event, the, the point of this was really just to show that you can derive a lot of information just off of your interval data that will lead you to that sort of secondary investigation. All right, so that's it for me. And Mukesh, you have some slides? Thank you. It's so interesting. With all this data, you have to make good use of it. And that means it requires more digging and digging of information. And uh, one thing good is the more you dig into it, the more easily you find what is what are the opportunities there. So I got some other slides to show you very briefly. Um, some of them are basically discussing. One thing is good that I don't have to explain what Oracle is. Who doesn't know about Oracle? So that makes it very easy. So you can skip <laughs> on these slides very quickly and move on to the next one. But we do have an assortment of buildings. You know, you talked about building management system. You think of any building management system in the market today, we have it. We have over 20 million square foot of uh, real estate. Nearly half of it is owned, other half is leased. Some of them we have a triple net lease, we are fully responsible. There are others that we have no responsibility, we just lease it out and whatever information we get, we get. Um, it's not easy to get in, gather information from all of the sites into a single place and be cost effective. So we have been utilizing the built-in capabilities of each of the building management system and try to use this information. One of the things which we do is a simple thing. Look at the yearly energy consumption data for all, is, all of our buildings which are in our own portfolio. 
And you will see that they are not all the same. They're all varying up and down. So we tried to figure it out, the ones which are using less, are there any errors? And we did find errors there because they missed some data there. And the ones which are very high, and there also are there errors or not, and if there are, trying to figure it out, what can we go and uh, do it? Learn the lessons from the lower one, the one you use less, and apply it to the one which are high. You will see a line there which is around 15.8 kilowatt hours per square foot per year. So I looked at the data from the Energy Star for all locations we have in the US and found out that about 15.8 kilowatt per square foot per year, if you met that, you would get into the Energy Star qualification, the what they call Energy Star building. And it was very interesting. In some places, if they are very cold, then your heating bills are high. The ones which are in the hot climate, the cooling bills are high, the heating is low, but when you add them together, the number was coming up pretty close to be about 15.8. Uh, so that's our benchmark kind of a thing. We look at it. If any time we can get energy consumption less than that, we are very happy. Uh, these are some of the ways we are trying to see, figure it out, what took us down, so where we can apply it. This is one of the buildings we have in Virginia area. Uh, basically, you can see in the schematic here. And I wanted to ask you guys, uh, what do you think is wrong with this one? Can anybody see anything wrong going on here? Can when I looked at it and I went bananas, I said, what's happening in this building? Do you see here? What time is the building coming on? 1.30 in the morning. And this is winter climate, cold climate up there. And the facilities guy said, I need to bring this building on that early in the morning, otherwise people will be unhappy and comfortable. This is a Monday, and he was very kind that says, okay, because you're coming back after a weekend on Monday, I need to come on early. But other days, I can be de delayed, but still coming at 4.30 in the morning. So this is something we want to go, and one of the things I found out is, no matter what I talk to my facility engineers and say, change it, they will change it when I'm there, you walk away, they'll change it back to where they were. <laughs> so it's uh, important for them to bring them on board so that once they apply it, they will stick with it. So that's the biggest challenge we have. And uh, so one of the things we did was, over a period of time, explain them and said, okay, let's try it one week and see what happens. And uh, this is what we did. We did try it. And we went on all days at 6.30 in the morning instead of uh, about uh, 1.30 and then 4.30. And you could see here, there was significant saving to be had. Now, who has ever heard of the rule of a third? One third. Yeah, so you, at any given time, if you look at your buildings, you have the potential to save about one third of the energy. And we have proven it, I'll show you some data. So if you look at it, what we did notice, and I'm going to compare these two slides on top and other so that you can see in the alignment, instead of coming back so early in the morning, we are coming back late. But also we noticed that our energy consumption on the first day increased in the morning to 1200 or more kilowatt. And that is obviously because the building was shut down over the weekend and you had had a much higher energy use there. We learned something else in this building. How many of you know that most of the buildings in the US, even today, do cooling, and once it becomes too cold, they start heating it up. It's very common. I mean, 90% of the building today are man managed in that way. They have a central system, a complete VAV box that feeds about eight or 10, about 1,500 square foot area, and you're supplying the cooling from a central plant to that particular unit. It cools it, and a certain area becomes a little more cold, you bring on the heaters. So this is a, one thing we found in here too. And uh, what we did was we look at the VAV boxes, the variable air volume boxes. And there, from there we figured it out that in the morning when you're trying to do cool down, it brings down the temperature so quickly in about 15, 20 minutes that you didn't have to have it for four hours or two hours or one hour ahead of time. So the shortest time, and this was, it was this type of data that was able to convince our facilities engineers to see, look, this is what's showing up. You only need this much of time, so give it a try. And once they get into it, then they love it. 
The same thing happened in terms of a airflow demand. When you bring the building up early in the morning, because there's a heat buildup, you require a lot of airflow in the beginning. Once everything is settles down, then you don't need as much of the cooling. And this was another information when they saw it, hey, there's no occupancy happening between 6.30 till about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, and then the airflow begins to pick up. You really don't need to start the building so early in the morning. So if we look at it, uh, this is a very interesting slide. This is basically show, proves the point that what you need to do. You do this, uh, this particular system is one of the systems we have in the UK. You do the cooling of the air, then it goes and splits into the situation and the two different ducts. One of them starts heating it up again. And this is the kind of system I mentioned. Also what happens is that there are dampers and the dampers pinch up the airflow because you don't need as much airflow. You're trying to create a very high pressure here and then try to block the airflow so that you don't deliver as much air as you need. So those are our static pressure set point. And every time you go and talk to an engineer that I want to reduce a set point, oh, the person in the corner is not going to be happy because he's not going to get the air. And when you show them the data, look, your dampers are trying to restrict it. If this damper was completely open, for example, then you don't have to put high pressure on this fan over here. So if I have to uh, no, summarize if three or four big items that can save me energy today in any building towards reaching my goal of a one third, these will be the four items. Look at your start time, look at your stop time. Not only for the building HVAC systems, HVAC systems, look at the lighting system, look at the outdoor lighting systems, all of them, you should really look at it and that will give you what you are looking for. Supply air temperature. You don't need to supply very cold air all the time and then start reheating it up. Reset the temperature up. And you don't have to supply a very high pressure and try to put a damper to choke the airflow. That doesn't work out too. So those are the kind of things simply can be done. And uh, I was at a very recent conference where one of the person remarked very eloquently, now, we have done a lot of things besides this. We have done a lot of things on the periphery that would really be very, very advanced and give you savings, like starting up early in the morning or when you know there's a hot day today, try to cool the building up and then let it warm up slowly. Those all help. But this person, when he mentioned it, reminded me of the very simple thing. He said, somebody asked Warren Buffett during the, energy, you know, during the financial crisis, remember 2010 when we, everything was built down? He made a simple observation. He said, there is so much money to be made in the core operations that you don't have to run on the periphery. Same way, there is so much money to be made from the core simple things to be done in the building automation control systems that you really do not have to do, necessarily do on the periphery. Good to do it, good to, good to go look into all of those things, but don't ignore the simple things. And this is what we did. This is what we, a rule of one third, it took us 10 years to achieve it, but we did. We exceeded that. Over the years, this is for a 2 million square foot campus we have in the Redwood Shores. We started in the 2000, when that was the baseline, and over the years, we have been able to exceed that goal, and uh, it continues to go down. This is for the electricity we have for the natural gas. It keeps on jumping up and down. Uh, it was down in uh, 2009, and then suddenly decided to go up. We figured, had to figure it out what's happening here. But this is the data that is very powerful to us and also to our management on the upper end, uh, so they can understand what's going on, and also to the people who are really operating the buildings so that they feel comfortable. Sorry. I think that was the end of it, but I have some other slides, and I can show you on the similar case studies. There are plenty of them, but we want to open it for questions to any of the panelists and see what we can provide you some in insights. Yes. Good. Oh, well, I was wondering if, if any of you have explored um, technologies that purport to disaggregate uh, whole premise, whole building energy use into uh, by end use, and whether that further level of disaggregation of interval meter data uh, by major classes of end uses would provide any additional uh, any additional value in the upside. I guess I'll start. So uh, similar to George and. What Ralph described, we looked at systems that integrate a lot of that data, and then we do a lot of monthly reporting, not only internally, but also to our customers, where we're showing them again the data to help us understand what's what's going on, and by the way, how can you help us change it, right? Because they're really the ones ultimately leaving the lights on, using their computers, or, or using that IT equipment. 
Um, so far, we haven't got it to pencil out. I mean, even with our with our uh, lab project, where we're close to a million dollars, it's just really costly to implement. Um, it's also a long time, and what we're finding is that we can do a lot of it without getting to that level of, of reporting. We can do it with just whatever data we have. We can produce a lot of savings. And I would say the same thing that you know we've done an awful lot of submuting of subsystems and so forth. But I really have to say that in spite of that, the bang for the buck has been just from looking at the overall graphs and, mm -hmm. and capturing it. So to, to answer your question about this uh, seg disaggregation of data, I think it's one of the most powerful tools we can have. I'll give you, we have a lighting circuit in our building, which is feeding about 30 different lighting breakers. Now, if you take, talk to your people, they say, oh, the lights are not supposed to come at a night time. They will stay off. But there's no way to verify that. If I had a means of desegregating data from all these 30 circuits from measuring only one data point, I can identify which particular circuits were left on or were not turned off when they were supposed to go on. So I've been, I talked to some companies which have been working on it. They are more focused on the residential side, so they want to know when the refrigerator comes on, when your uh, dishwasher comes on uh, or dryer comes on but they have not really focused on the commercial side. And I would be very happy if somebody comes up and says, here's the meter data, let me take a look at it, and I can desegregate and tell you which particular circuit was left on or turned off, will be very helpful. Thank you. Jack? Um, and Victor, Victor, you talked, I believe, about having um, a software application that monitored plug loads with motion sensors. And if, I, if I'm remembering your comments correctly, could you talk a little bit more about that and how that operates at the Sure. So the, um, I guess one correction. So it's not tied to, we have motion sensors in our labs, but it's just for automated lighting, right? We have separate zones, the cold aisle, the hot aisles. The, um, the software that I was referring to is there's two components. There's at a plug level now, down to the equipment, even A and B bus power supplies, we can monitor how much power we're consuming. We can also lock it out, turn it on, turn it off. So we're now trying to understand, uh, you know, power consumption at a utilization level, right? So what's the capacity, really how much are they using? And instead of buying more equipment, you know, if there's 50% compute power there left, you know, challenge them on buying more. So that, that's sort of a, you know, one side of the equation. The other side is we do, um, we are looking at scheduling software so that and the concept there is instead of again, you know, having 10,000 pieces of equipment, only 50% uh, of it's being used, instead of buying more equipment, you know, how do we uh, create a software tool that, that reserves the, the equipment so that uh, we leverage the existing capital instead of buying more equipment, building more lab space, consuming more energy. So that's kind of two separate software components that we're looking at. So to sort of expand on that one, you mentioned about the isolates. The person who developed the isolates, who built and sold it, sitting in right in, a, in our audience. Uh, can you raise your hand, Jim? So he's the one who built these systems, and they were very helpful. What happens, it comes as your uh, plug, which has got six points. Two of them can be run continuously, but four of them are based on emotion sensors. That is like your monitor or a printer or something else that you don't need to be running all the time. If it doesn't detect emotion, it will go offline. So if you have a radio sitting in your office or if you have some fan or electric heater or something, those can all be cycled off very easily. It's a very, very powerful device. Uh, I bought a bunch of it for all my campus and it helped me a lot. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, a lot of the, the comments and examples related to uh, monitoring based commissioning on an ongoing basis. Okay. As far as the capital projects go, internally, what would you say your hurdle rate would be? And if you have projects uh, beyond your hurdle rate, would you be open to go to third party financing of these projects? Want to address that? So we, we've implemented monitoring based commissioning and took advantage of the rebates. Um, hurdle rate in terms of IRR is north of 10%. The um, simple payback periods, we generally need to target about two year. The question about whether or not we'd go third party finance. Um, we're, we're quite cash strong, but we've just recently announced a dividend, so that position's probably changing, <laughs> <laughs> which also means we've got uh, 
some debt that we're going to do financing capital on. So I think the payback scenarios are going to be challenged by our finance group. Uh, but essentially, third-party financing or going into the uh, debt market is essentially the same equation. It just becomes a question of how much premium we've got to pay. Uh, but I think the deployment of capital, regardless of whose capital, is still going to have to meet a, a strong business case. So depending on the project, I'd say two years usually can get through quite well. Three years, you've got to probably sell the management a little more. Anything north of three and you know above five is almost not considered. There's a question in the back first. Yeah. Uh, two questions uh, that should look pretty quick. Uh, First of all, I'm curious if uh, the insights that you're gaining from this data um, suggest to you different than how you might uh, expect to train or, or hire uh, building operators, and if you think that's something that needs to, you know, how they might propagate the industry. And the other question is whether any of these insights have led to um, changes in how you think about longer term investments, maybe downsizing children or other things that are going to happen infrequently, but you're better prepared for them, perhaps. Particularly to your first question, uh, yes, it, it, it's changed how we hire uh, operating engineers, for example, uh, significantly. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we found that generally speaking, they're not necessarily analytical. Uh, a very interesting story, I think, uh, when we first certified the first building back in 2006, uh, one of our engineers went off to tell his dad about it, who was a chief engineer for another building, and thought, you know, he learned a lot in the process. He was a skeptic on the front end, learned a lot in the process, became a huge enthusiast, went to tell his dad he needed to do the same thing with this uh, uh, classic building in downtown San Francisco. And his father looked at him and said, why would I want to do that? It's more work for me. If anything goes wrong, it's my fault. And if it's a success, then the manager takes all the credit. <laughs> uh, probably represents the thinking of a large percentage of uh, building operating engineers. But there's also a whole new wave now uh, that are, are really much more analytical, uh, much looking to the future, excited about being involved with it and so forth. And I'm, you know, when I'm looking at resumes, I'm looking for a lot of discussion about energy management and sustainability and so forth. And I'm looking for the ones that are excited about the things we're doing and want to be part of that. Uh, the other thing is I do spend a lot of money on training them. Uh, besides sending them off to take the, the classes with the uh, control system companies for whatever building it is, uh, and the enhanced classes as well, uh, there's a lot of other classes I'm sending them to now, and I'm also giving them bonuses if they get their lead AP and just a whole variety of things because I just found there's a tremendous return in it when everybody's aligned and marching in the same direction. There was a question here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it seems like everyone on the panel has uh, achieved very strong energy reductions. Uh, is energy efficiency a, a done job for you? Uh, is it finished essentially, or if not, what's next? Well, number one, it never stops because the technology is constantly improving and, and uh, the processes and the way we think about it and look at it is constantly changing. That's why I like that one graph of Seattle is because each year they just keep coming down and down as we find yeah. more things and implement more things. So. Yeah. And the rule of one third remains in place. Uh, we looked at the yeah. building, which was doing very good, one of the lowest energy consumption, and we are still continue to drive it down. So there are only thing is becomes a little bit more involved, but there are opportunities are always there. Well, but 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 I, I do want to. So we we are subscribed in our ISO fourteen thousand one target objectives to reduce energy on a kilowatt hour per square foot basis. And we're, we're hitting that area where we're finding a uh, few projects that we can implement, optimize, uh, and now we've got to resort to capital investments to get incremental energy efficiency. So that's maybe that you know threshold that you say, okay, well, what are your goals? And, and we're looking at a continuous improvement of um, roughly 6% per square foot per year, which is getting to be almost unachievable. So we're maybe resetting that goal to, okay, how do we, you know, beat Energy Star as a benchmark? But, but I think there is that problem as, oh, okay, when do you got to make capital investments for incremental energy efficiency that then still has to meet a business case? Um, which I, I think was going to answer part of your question. In an older building, you can probably afford to upgrade uh, chill water plants, for example. 
In newer buildings, uh, it's much more difficult. In fact, you've got a tremendous amount of book value remaining on that chill water plant, irrespective of whether or not it's operating optimally. Uh, and use cases changes. In fact, we have that exact problem in that building that has a pretty good uh, energy star score. We actually sized that chill water plant to have flexibility to build a lab in that building. We've subsequently decided we weren't going to put a lab in that building. Now we've got oversized chillers, oversized yeah. pumps, mm -hmm. but we implemented a, a, a basically a water side economizer project that allowed us to optimize that deficiency of just use case changes. Yeah. But we can't afford to change yeah. it because there's you know the almost yeah. on a six year old building, the majority of that capital investment is still on the books. In and the industry is changing very fast in certain areas like IT equipment. How many of you have the old CRT type of monitors anymore? And the laptops that go off, uh, go into sleep mode all the time. So a lot of savings came from there. We are taking the credit. Actually, the credit is your technology. Yeah, that's because you're not yeah. working. <laughs> 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 so I was just going to add, uh, yeah. you know, to our campus, our buildings are only three years old. Uh, in terms of the uh, Title 24 calcs that came, we exceeded by 24%. Our original PUE was 1.3. So even in new buildings, with all that commissioning we did, and as energy efficient, we've been able to improve on that and continuously find projects or ideas, or or even the environment's changing, right? Or our expectations are changing, expanding the temperature ranges, whether it's in the data center or in the office space, especially with Cotton's Day, right? They continue to say, how can we operate more efficiently, whether it's on a per basis or a headcount basis? I think uh, the you know, that's also driving the basis of our financial ideas. And it is a question of, okay, is it low hanging fruit? Is there cost involved? And sometimes, uh, some years, it's, it's more of those lines, low hanging fruit, we find that. Yes, it continues to sound as people can fix it, and a few years later, guess what? It's back to where it was. Right? Somebody want to change something, uh, and if you don't, you're not looking at that in a whole data, you're back to where you are. So. so that that's the whole idea behind continuous commissioning and automating continuous commissioning, is that you are constantly watching and monitoring everything and checking it, because it does degrade over time. Uh, and I also think about, you know, back in 2006 when we started, actually 2005 when we started to uh, go out for lead certification that first building, we'd done about 30 projects and we'd also had a couple of engineering firms look over our shoulder and tell us, yeah, we'd pretty much captured all the low-hanging fruit. In the process of going through certification in, in one year, we found 34 more projects that were, we spent as much again as we'd already spent, but had an even better return on investment, 148% return on investment for those 34 projects that, according to the engineering firms, didn't exist. Uh, and, you know, now it's, what, 140 projects or something like that? And, and overall, in the beginning, our payback was less than a year when we bundled them all together. Now it's, I forgot what I said, 1.2 years or something. And, and we're looking at projects that we're maybe have a three or four year payback uh, on a regular basis. So, yeah, we've moved up the tree higher, but there's, there's still things happening all the time. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've gone through and changed out all our lamps to the next generation and, and even... Um, with that, that cost of changing it out, have the whole thing pay for itself in less than a year. We're on, you know, in some cases, our fourth generation of lamps in 10 or 12 years. Last question. Yeah. Uh, to, to what extent has uh, the insights that you've gained from this data enabled you to participate uh, more broadly or nimbly in demand response programs? We don't participate in them anymore. We started out, I think we were one of the ones in the very early stages. Now we have our own program we basically are operating in-house doing demand response all the time because we're saving a lot of money doing that. And we're now starting to work with a company to go back and see if we can figure out a way to maintain and capture the, the peaks so that we have something to compare against so that we can continue doing demand response you know, multiple days a week during the summer, for example, but still recognize the peaks to measure against so we can also uh, re get the return from the demand response program. So, so I'm sure there's still more questions. I know there is another session starting shortly. You are welcome to come to the speakers. They will still be here. So please feel free to come back. Thank you. Thank you.